In exercise one, we're told that Emily is solving an equation and we're given the beginning equation and her first step. We want to know which property justified the first step. Let's begin by organizing what we're given. We're given the original equation and the equation after her first step. Look carefully and notice the difference. It looks like she added nine to both sides. This is the addition property of equality and so our answer is choice one. In exercise two, we're told that the officials in a town are using a function called C to analyze traffic patterns. We're told that C of N represents the rate of traffic through an intersection and that N is the number of observed vehicles in a specified time interval. In other words, the number of cars that come down the road. We're asked which of these choices would be the most appropriate domain for the function. Now remember, domain refers to the inputs. In this exercise, n is the inputs, the number of vehicles, and so the inputs have to make sense for a number of cars that we would see traveling down the road. Let's take a look at our choices. Choice one shows all of the integers, from negative infinity right up to infinity. Those three dots at the beginning and at the end of that domain indicate that the pattern continues endlessly. It doesn't make sense to have negative two or negative one cars going down the road, or any negative number for that matter and so choice one is not an appropriate domain in this exercise. Choice two also doesn't make any sense. Choice two shows the values negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, or three. While zero, one, two, and three are valid values for this function, we could have zero cars, one, two, or three cars going down the road. We'll never see a negative number of cars, and negative two, negative one would not be valid inputs, so choice two is not appropriate. Choice three has some values that are also not appropriate. One half, one and a half, two and a half. I've never seen a half of a car going down the road, and so that's not an appropriate value in our domain. The last choice is simply the whole numbers, zero, one, two, three, etc. This does make sense in our problem, the number of vehicles, and so choice four is our answer as the most appropriate domain for the function. In exercise three, we're given two polynomials and we're asked to find the difference a minus b. Let's begin by organizing the information that we're given. a is three x squared plus five x minus six. b is negative two x squared minus six x plus seven. We're asked to find the difference a minus b. Let's begin by writing this out put each of the polynomials in parentheses and put the subtraction in the middle. The parentheses are important because we need to distribute that subtraction as a negative and change our sign to addition. We do that and then we can combine like terms and we find 5x squared plus 11x minus 13 is the difference a minus b. The answer is choice two. In exercise four, we have a system of inequalities. Remember, a system of inequalities is two or more inequalities connected by the word and. When we solve a system of inequalities, we're looking for the values, x and y, that make both of the inequalities true simultaneously. We can solve a system of inequalities by shading and finding the area that is shaded by both of them. The values in that area shaded by both are the solutions to the system of inequalities. In this exercise, we begin by putting both of the inequalities into slope-intercept form. When we do that with the first one, we see that the slope is negative one and the y-intercept is two. Notice that the inequality symbol is greater than, which means we'll be shading upward from the line and we'll be, it'll be a dashed line because it's not equal to, it's simply greater than values. It doesn't include the values on the line. The second inequality, is already in slope-intercept form. We see that we have a slope of three, a y-intercept of negative two, and that the symbol is less than or equal to. For that inequality, we'll be shading downward from the line, and that will be a solid line because the values are equal to, so the line is included. When we graph our inequalities, we begin by graphing and then shading. Here's our first one shaded, greater than negative x plus two. Notice the line is dashed because the symbol simply says greater than, not greater than or equal to. 
we can now graph and shade our other inequality. The area shaded by both is known as the solution set. Take a look at the four choices. It looks like choice 1 and choice 2 very closely match our graph. But what's the difference between those two? If we look closely, we see one of them has a solid line and one of them has a dashed line. Which one is correct? Comparing to our original graph, which showed y was greater than negative x plus 2, that line should be dashed. And so the answer is choice 2. In exercise 5, we're asked which value of x satisfies the given equation. Remember, what that means is what value of x makes this equation true. There are a couple of different ways you could approach a problem like this. The first way is to solve the equation, and this is kind of a challenging one. We could solve this equation by clearing the fractions. Begin by multiplying both sides by 3. Then distribute the 7. Again, we have another fraction to clear, so we can multiply by 28, and then solve the resulting equation. When we do that, we find that x equals 8.25, and so our answer is choice 1. But there are other ways we could go about solving this problem. We want to know which of these four values satisfies the equation, which value makes it true. We could take each of those values and substitute it into the equation and see which one resulted in a true number sentence. Notice when we substitute in 8.25 for choice 1, we end up with 20 equals 20, which is a true sentence. That means that 8.25 is a solution to the equation. When we try choice 2, 8.89, we end up with 21.493 repeating equals 20, which is clearly false. That indicates that 8.89 is not a solution. Choice 3, 19.25, also causes a false statement, which means that that is not a solution. And the same is true with choice 4, which gives a clearly false statement also. Once again, we see that 8.25 is the solution to the equation, and so choice 1 is our answer. In exercise 6, we're given a table that shows the average yearly balance in a savings account where interest is compounded annually. No money is deposited or withdrawn after the initial amount is deposited, and we're shown a table where x is the years and y is the balance in dollars. We're asked which type of function best models the given data, a linear function or an exponential. Let's take a look at the scatter plot, plot on the graphing calculator and determine what the shape is. By looking at the shape, we'll know if it's linear or if it's exponential. The scatter plot reveals an exponential function. We see that the function is increasing. When dealing with exponential functions, an increasing function is known as exponential growth. A decreasing function is known as exponential decay. Looking at the choices carefully, we see that we have choice 4, an exponential growth function. In exercise 7, we're told that a company manufactures radios. They pay a startup cost and then spend a certain amount of money to manufacture each radio. How many radios they manufacture? Well, they manufacture R of them. We're given a function that represents this scenario. Take a look at the function carefully. Notice that we have a variable and a constant. The variable R represents the number of radios that we manufacture. How much is it per radio being manufactured? Five dollars and twenty-five cents. One twenty-five is a constant amount. That must be the startup cost, $125. The question asks, what does the value 5.25 best represent? 525 represents the cost per radio. And so, let's look carefully at the choices. Choice 1 says the startup cost. The startup cost is represented by 125, so that's not it. Let's look at choice 2, the profit earned from the sale of one radio. Well, we, this has nothing to do with the profit earned from radios. This is the cost to produce them, and so choice 2 is not correct. Choice 3 says the amount spent to manufacture each radio. That sounds right. We're told that R was the number of radios, and 5.25 is the cost to manufacture each one. Let's just read choice 4 to see if it makes sense. The average number of radios manufactured. Nope. 
5.25 is not the average number of radios manufactured, it's the cost to manufacture one radio, and so our answer is choice 3.